everybody. Welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Happy Monday evening to you. Hope you and your family are doing well during this pandemic. Uh, do me a favor. Tell me hello. Tell me where you're tuning in from in the world. We're going to dive in tonight to, to the topic of tonight's show is what should you be doing now? So um, a lot of you are locked into your homes and um, maybe going a little bit stir crazy. So we're going to talk a little bit about what you should be thinking about, what you should be doing. Now, I'd like to also take just a minute to thank all of our ER doctors and nurses and you know front-end healthcare providers who are out there doing an amazing job just trying to help people navigate this thing. So, and if you are a healthcare provider on that front end, say hi, chime in, let us know so that we can send you props and, uh, and give you graceful thanks. So again, thanks to all of those who are out there on the front lines, you know, helping us out with this situation. So let's talk a little bit about what you should be doing as we speak right now. There's a lot of unknowns. So a lot of you, maybe you're sitting at home every day and the news is on and the TV's on and you're searching the internet and you're trying to figure out as much about this as possible. But I would encourage you, um, you know, a lot of you, again, a lot of you are asking the question, how many people are going to get sick? How many people are going to die? You know, when, you know, when will this end? When will the social distancing end? When will the self-quarantine at home be over? Like, when is all of this going to end? And the big answer is, is we don't know, right? Nobody knows at this point. We don't know. We can speculate all we want. Even the experts don't know. But I think it's important that you wrap your mind around this right here because, you know, a lot of you were told that the, this whole thing was going to end next week, um, and it's not. Now it's being, you know, kind of prolonged. So I would just say buckle down. There's a lot of unknowns, and, and we just don't know. So driving yourself and your family crazy over this lack of knowledge isn't going to help you. It's actually just going to serve to continue to increase your stress at home, to continue to increase your stress overall in this ordeal. And that's not going to help you maintain your health or your sanity. So Again, the bottom line is the quicker you can wrap your mind around the we don't know component, uh, I think the better off you're going to be. So some of, the, uh, some of you are also kind of struggling because I know just, just in my own office here, you know, we have people who have lost jobs. We have um, people who are struggling with finances, right? And these are major issues, major stress points. We've got people with kind of the unknown of if, when we go back to work, will the job still be there? When we go back to work, will um, I have to start looking for another job because there isn't one? Like all these things are big unknowns. Now we've got this, you know, not to get too political because I, I really, this is not a political show, but we've got the stimulus package that was passed and that's designed of course to help people get back on their feet and to stay on their feet as this thing kind of roils and boils over us. But bottom line is we don't know and if you fall in these categories here, the best thing that you can do is, is kind of, well, it's easy for me to stand here and say to let it go. But how many of you know the serenity prayer? So let's just put up that because I think that's probably the best advice that I could give any of you in this time. And that very simply put, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And right now, what you can't control is you can't control who's going to lose jobs, where the job's going to be available, how long we're going to be on self-quarantine. You can't control how many people are going to be sick, how many people are going to die. You can't control um, the timing or the time frame around this. It's just going to run its course, and that's all you can really do. And, and so in times of high stress, especially if you're a type A personality, and a lot of you are, um, you want to control every aspect of life. It can be really even more challenging for those of you who have that type of personality. And so I recommend that you get, uh, you get real serious about kind of a deeper understanding about the fact that you don't have control over this situation. There's not a whole lot you're going to be able to do to navigate it. There's not a whole lot that you're going to be able to do to change the outcome of what happens except in your own home, except in your own body. So, you know, the big thing here is, is don't worry about what the rest of the world is doing or how long this is going to take, but worry some more about what you're doing and what you're going to do to help yourself kind of get through this. Because one thing is for sure, once we're through this epidemic, this pandemic, 
that's, you know, that's just getting warmed up in the U.S. here. Um, once we get through it, life will be different for many of you. Life will be very, very different for many of you. And so what you need to be thinking about and focusing on right now is, is yourself. How can you improve upon yourself so that you're ready to deal with the aftermath of what may come? Okay. And that's, again, that's the best advice that I can give you. So in your daily life, let's make some room here. In your daily life, there are a few things. I'm going to put up a slide here that I think you should focus on. Now, this is not limited. This list is not limited. Um, but what should you be focused on right now? I think number one, you should be focused on you. And so there's some things that you can focus on. Number one, if you're talking about immune focus, I've spent the last month and a half teaching, you know, what you should be most focused on in terms of, you know, nutrition and your immune system, because the best offense is a good defense. So when your immune system is healthy, it can take care of you. So it reduces your risk. But we talked about sleep a little bit. You should be focusing on sleep. Sleep is critical. Um, without sleep, the immune system begins to falter. There's so much research on the benefit of getting sleep and actually having an improved immune function. In essence, an improved immune memory, an improved immune function. This is one of the reasons why we were last week when we were talking about histamines or antihistamines, many of you during allergy season are taking those medicines. And I said, look, antihistamines disrupt deep REM sleep. And I said, this is one of the reasons why, unless, unless your quality of life is so poor that you should try to forego using antihistamines is because, again, they disrupt that sleep. And that sleep is more important right now with all the stress that many of you are under to recover from that stress. So antihistamines will disrupt your ability to get that adequate sleep, but you need to be focused on it. Now, other things you need to be focused on, we've talked about eating real food, right? You need to focus on eating real food. You need to be focusing on sunshine where applicable, where you can get it. Some of you are further north. It's harder to come by. Some of you are in different parts of the world where there's just less of it, but you need to be focused on it to the extent that you can get it. In other words, get as much as you can to the toleration that your skin will not get a sunburn as you're getting it. Fresh air. So again, fresh air, food, sleep. sunshine are all critical factors that you can't ignore. And then we've also got exercise is important right now. Um, one of the good things, a lot of you are on lockdown, but you're not on lockdown potentially from walking outside. Now, some of you may be, but those of you who aren't need to really be focused on this exercise piece in a big way. I'm going to talk a little bit about this one because some of you are in lockdown. So I want to talk about a, a little bit tonight about a principle around exercise that I think anybody can do no matter where you're at. And that is a style of exercise called Tabata. Now, if you haven't heard of this before, then pay attention. Tabata is the name of the scientist who actually, you know, researched exercise to try to determine what was the perfect amount of exercise without overdoing it, but also to be effective without underdoing it. And the real answer came back as about eight minutes a day. I know that may be new news to some of you, eight minutes a day of exercise. It doesn't hardly seem like it's enough. It is. Um, it's how you go about doing it. So a Tabata is a four-minute workout. And you can, with a Tabata, you can pick any particular movement. You don't have to, I mean, there's no magic. There we go. There's no magic to it. So let me give you some examples. So Tabata would be a four minute workout where you can pick any exercise that you want. Push-ups, sit-ups, squats, lunges, jump ropes, jumping jacks, burpees, um, jumping lunges, um, plank holds. If you've got some dumbbells at home, arm curls, shoulder presses, you name it, fill in the blank, right? It, Tabata is a four minute workout that you pick any activity or any exercise and just put it in. Now, what does this four minute pattern look like? It looks like 20 seconds of, of work, followed by 10 seconds of rest, and you do that times eight. That's eight rounds. So 30 seconds times eight is four minutes, right? So you got 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest. So let's say we pick a Tabata push-up, and you do 20 seconds of push-ups, nice and slow, nothing too quick. We're not in a big hurry. Tabata's good form, okay? The right form, and, 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 you, 
you want to make sure too that you don't overdo it. So pick something, you know, if you're using weights, pick something that's relatively light. If you've never done this before with a push-up, if you, you if you haven't done a push-up in 10 years, you may not start with a with a solid push-up on the ground. You might start with a wall push-up where you're pushing against the wall or where you're pushing against a high countertop or something of that nature. But scale the movement to your capacity to do it. But Tabata can be done at home. You can do, you know, Tabata a four-minute workout. You know, again, 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest. You do that eight rounds and you're done. After four minutes, you're done. Then you rest four minutes. Okay. Then you pick one more exercise and repeat. So, you know, if you really want to kind of get balanced about it, you know, you can do this four days a week. You don't even have to do this seven days a week. You can do this four days a week. But when you do it, pick an upper body activity and then pick a lower body activity. So if you're doing two of these Tabatas four times a week, you know, you're working in one aspect, you're working your lower body, another aspect, you're working your upper body. And this is all you really need to keep yourself healthy without a gym. So those of you who can't get to the gym right now, those of you who are landlocked in your home, you know, this Tabata style of activity can be very, very advantageous because number one, it doesn't require a ton of time. Number two, it doesn't require a lot of equipment. Remember, most of the equipment that you'll need for this is really pretty much body weight stuff. Now, if you have some equipment at home, more power to you, you'll have more variety. But again, push-ups, sit-ups, squats, lunges, plank holds, jump rope, jumping jack, burpees, these are all body weight stuff that require virtually no equipment. If you don't have a jump rope, you can jump in place. I mean, so there's really you don't really need any equipment to do Tabata style workouts and they will work you out. The whole premise of this is again, with this 20 seconds on 10 seconds off, you get to round eight, actually you get to round four, you're going to be panting pretty good and you're going to be tired to a certain extent, but you get to round five and it's going to get harder and harder and harder to five, six, seven, eight, you get to that eighth round and it's going to burn really, really bad. And it's going to, again, that burn is what we're after. That burn means, that you're working your body well enough to improve your muscle tone. Remember, we've talked about improving immune function. Uh, we haven't really talked about it in depth with exercise, but muscle mass, muscle tone is critical for immune function because what happens to a sick person laying in a hospital bed when, they're, when their immune systems don't have the strength to carry on is their immune systems start taking from the muscle, right? So your immune function and your muscle tone go hand in hand. When your immune system needs more help, it will steal your muscle to make antibodies to help you fight. So you want to have, you know, plenty of muscle tone in this regard. Now, if you if you don't at this point, and you know, it's not it's never too late to start building muscle. It's never too late to start doing this type of exercise. And remember, eight minutes is not so much that it's going to wipe you out and wear you out and make you so tired that you can't function or suppress your immune function because you've worked too hard. And that's why I encourage this style of activity right now for those of you who are stuck at home, especially if you don't have a gym or if you're used to having kind of fancier equipment. Now, because you're stuck at home, if you want to, you can just type this in, type this in, and you can look at different examples of Tabata workouts using body weight activity to get more ideas if you like. But this is the style that I would highly encourage you to implement right now is something that you can do. There's never been a better time in your life and there's never been a better excuse for you not to be able to exercise than right now, especially if you're on self-quarantine at home. Now, something else is that you can focus on, you can focus on your family. Um, think about all the things that you've ever thought about that you wished you had more time to do, right? This is it right here, folks. This is kind of everybody's especially those of you who work really long hours, this is all of your wishes come true in a sense, right? Not necessarily we want people around us getting sick, but having more time to spend with family, having more time to get that activity done, having more time to go for that walk, to ride your bike, having more time to learn how to crochet or to knit, having more time to read that book, to organize that closet, having more time to spend with your wife or your children or your you know, husband, et cetera. So now is the time. Focus on what you have control on focusing on. Family being an important part of that because part of our culture and part of what we've lost, in my opinion, over the last probably decade with technology is we've lost a lot of inherent family time together. Most people, a family time gather, a family gathering is four people in a room where they're all on their phones not talking to each other. But now 
you have this opportunity to reconnect and rekindle those relationships and make, make greater meaning from them. So use this time of tragedy to, you know, again, to enhance or improve the quality of your life, the quality of your relationships. Very important because you don't know when you're going to get another opportunity. And if you let this one pass you by, you might regret it. So focusing on those things in your daily life becomes pretty important. Let's talk about what not to focus on in your, in your life right now. So I was talking to somebody the other day and they were just, you could just tell they were really stressed out. Um, they were really high anxiety, really, really stressed out and I asked them what they'd been doing to be so stressed. And they said, they've been watching the news. And, uh, now many of you probably are watching the news right now to try to stay updated. And I know some of you actually have the news on in your house 24 seven. Actually, I talked to somebody and they have the news on in their house playing 24 seven. Best advice I can give you is don't do that. Okay. Right now the news is overblowing this thing they're overblowing the danger. They're overblowing the death rates. And it's not to say that people aren't dying. And that's not to say that this thing's not a pandemic and that this is not a serious incident that's going on right now. It's just simply to say that the news works on selling you fear. And if you allow that into your heart, if you allow that into your household, then you know, it's going to affect your health in a negative way. Remember fear activates a part of our nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight nervous system. You've heard me talk about, about that. So if you have that news on 24 seven, that fear sets in and it increases your sympathetic nervous tone. Why is that a bad thing? Because the sympathetic tone, when it's increased, this is fight or flight. If you ever heard that term fight or flight, that's what I'm referring to. It, it increases your adrenaline, increases the hormones of stress, cortisol and adrenaline. And so what does cortisol do? Cortisol raises your blood sugar. And when you have your elevations in blood sugar, this is what, you know, over time, long periods of time, that's what they call diabetes, right? But we don't want elevations in blood sugar if we're stuck at home because we're stuck at home in fear, but we have nowhere to run. We have no, you know, we're, we're limited in terms of our capacity for exercise, unless you're doing what I just showed you to do that Tabata activity. So you're sitting there in your mind with fear spinning in your mind with no physical outlet for that fear. And that will drive up your blood sugar. And when you're not exercising and you don't have that activity, that blood sugar is just going to be floating around thinking it needs to be used as energy because you're in a fight or flight mode, but there's no fight or there's no flight. The only fight or flight is in your mind. And so you have to tune out the fear mongering so that you can turn down the sympathetic response, which is what we want. Remember when sympathetic is turned on, what else does that do? That reduces your nutrition by suppressing digestion. So we think when we're trying to run away from a bad guy, we're not really trying to digest that meal, right? So we want our nutrition and our digestion to be really, really solid right now. We want it to be solid because nutrition is one of the most critical components to keeping your immune system strong during this time, to help, you know, as much as possible, prevent you from getting sick. So you want to keep out of that fear mode. So keep that news, you know, turn it on. You know, if you want to get an update once a day, or if you've got a web, my advice would be go to some of these websites that are actually collecting, collecting the statistics and look at that if you want to look at that. But for the most part, again, these are things you can't change. You can't change the statistics. You can't change the infection rate, the mortality rate, the morbidity rate. You can't change whether or not uh, there's a, a major emergency room catastrophe in your hometown. Those are things you don't have the control or the power over to change unless you're an emergency room physician or an emergency room nurse or somebody who's working in that environment, in which case then you're on the front line. But most of you are not on that front line. So focus on what you can and avoid the fear. So news and TV... Try to keep those to a minimum right now, unless it's for entertainment purposes and also internet. So, you know, we can actually say this too. Now, if you've been watching me over the last few months. You know that you know, even the internet is, is driving some of this too. They're driving it in one way. Um, I don't know if you, again, I'm going to keep reiterating the New York Post accused me of recommending near lethal doses of vitamins, even though they couldn't back up the statement when I sent them the research and they, they actually withdrew what they said. Um, the internet is spreading fear in different ways. And that's an example of how they were spreading fear is, is by saying that, you know, worrying about nutrition is actually near lethal. So again, um, 
you know, watch your sources, watch who you're tuning into. And if it's creating a sense of frenzy in you and it's creating a state of panic in you, you know, you need to shut it off, do it for yourself and then focus on other things. Now, the other thing I would say that you shouldn't be doing right now is speculation. And this is human nature. So, you know, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, don't speculate, but intelligent people will speculate. But what I really mean by this is not that you can't speculate on what's going on in the world with COVID-19. It's, it's more, don't go down the rabbit hole. Man, for, there's a thousand theories out there right now on how the government is, you know, part of the government is trying to ruin Trump. That's one of the theories, right? The other, the other, there are several other theories. Some of it is where they're trying to mandate vaccines and they're using COVID as a mess, as a messenger to do this and that they're going to, you know, inject nanobots into you so that they can track you everywhere. Like, stop all that. Like, you're not going to, you can't control or change any of that. So whether it's a theory that's valid or whether it's a theory that's completely bogus and bunk, there's not a whole lot that you can do. And it doesn't serve you to dwell on all these different rabbit hole theories that people are coming up with. You know, even if there might be a degree of truth to certain things, again, it doesn't mean that you need to spin your wheels on these things. Control the things that you can, and that really boils back down to you. Number one is you. So if you want to control some things, control your current situation in your current environment. If you got caught unawares by this whole thing and you didn't have enough food, you know, then control the learning mechanism of next time I'm going to prepare a little bit better. If you, um, if you, again, if you have, uh, if you have not the best of health because you're struggling with an autoimmune problem or you're struggling with some other health issue because you haven't been eating right, because you haven't been sleeping well, because you've been overworking, like now you don't have any more excuses. Now all you have is time to focus on yourself and to focus on your family. So now it's really time to get to work. So um, don't focus on the TV. Don't focus on the fear mongering. Don't focus on the theories that are out there. You know, take care of your house and your house will take care of you. That's the best that I can give you. So let's talk about what you do have time to do today. And so I'd like, I'd like you guys to chime in as well on what you plan on doing. So now you have time to see your kids, to spend with your spouse. You've got time to engage uh, with people who love you in your home directly. You've got time to start that exercise program, to ride that bike. You've got time to clean that closet or organize that closet that you've been focusing on. You got time to read that book. Like if you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, hint, hint, um, pick up your copy and start reading it, especially if you struggle with autoimmune disease and you want to find your path back to wellness and health. Now you've got time, fill in the blank. What do you've got time to do? What is it that you've always wanted to do that life got in the way that you couldn't do? So, you know, those of you who are paying attention, chime in, let us know. What are you going to be doing? What are you going to do to improve yourself as opposed to sitting in fear and sitting in hypersympathetic dominant states uh, that's only going to continue to destroy your health. So what are you going to do that's going to be the antithesis to that? So fill in the blank and uh, and talk to me. So that being the case, I want to I want to give a shout out to and I and I shot a video and it should be published here in the next day or two on vitamin C because there's some information that new information coming out about vitamin C. But I want to give a shout out to Dr. Weber. He's a doc in New York. Um, who's injecting or IVing 1,500 milligrams of vitamin C into all his COVID-diagnosed patients. And then they're getting three to four treatments of 1,500 milligrams of IV vitamin C throughout the day as they're there. And what he is finding is he's finding better outcomes in those people who are being treated with vitamin C. So kudos to Dr. Weber for pulling together such a I'll say dangerous, according to the New York Post, dangerous level of treatment that, that he had the courage enough to actually implement it in the hospital system. And what, what they're seeing on the ground is they're seeing improved outcomes and improved results as a result of using that tool. So kudos to Dr. Weber and thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for having the courage to bring that into the hospital system. It's, it's, it was long overdue and I'm just super, super excited to see that you're using that and that that's helping people recover a little bit better. So let's open the floor up for any questions that any of you have. And so we can talk about anything COVID-19, anything coronavirus. Uh, we can talk about um, anything that you need help with tonight in that regard. Let's see here. Yeah, I agree. Cox postulates are not being adhered to. So testing is not being done correctly to determine the virus. I mean, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, but can we change whether or not they're going to start adhering to Cox postulates? Not really. Um, 
Margie says, I used to have oral herpes and the L-lysine knocked it out flat. Will it do the same for this virus? Should I be taking it as a preventative? Margie, there's no research on L-lysine being used in COVID-19 or for my knowledge, even being used with a coronavirus type of infection. So even, you know, again, coronavirus is a family of viruses, covid uh, this new one, this SARS-CoV causes COVID-19. And so, or as some people are calling it the Wuhan, really that's what it is, the Wuhan virus. Um, so there's no research that says that L-lysine helps. I've done a number of topics on things that have uh, what research is showing to be more promising results. Like right now, there's some preliminary data. There's some computational research studies that show, and again, they're computational, so they haven't been tried in humans, but computational trials show in, that vitamin C might be helpful, that quercetin might be helpful, um, and that some other plant uh, compounds um, found in green tea might be helpful. So there, there's, some, there's some computational research studies, but it's all just too new. Even the studies on vitamin C, I, I mentioned earlier that Dr. Weber in New York is using vitamin C and finding better results. That at this point is all anecdotal. It's not research-based, but you know, anecdote is what, what matters when you're in the trenches and on the grounds doing the work. There's a study going on right now on vitamin C therapy uh, in Wuhan, China, being used for people with COVID-19. And you know, the results have just not been published. They're not done yet. So at this point, we're still waiting back on any kind of research. So could you take L-lysine? You could. Would it be preventative? We don't know. There's just not there's just not any evidence and just not any direct research that shows that that would be helpful. You know, my my advice for any of you looking to ask the question, what are the supplements that you should be taking right now? Go back and watch some of the past shows that I've done where we talked about vitamin C, we talked about NAC and acetylcysteine, we talked about quercetin. Um, as being some of the bigger guns. We talked about zinc as being important in all of this. So we talked about a number of different strategies. If, you haven't, if you're new to the show and you didn't watch those, just go back and watch the last two to three weeks of shows. There's a ton of information there that we don't have time to get into all those details tonight. Uh, Nunya asks, is the rumor of ibuprofen and Advil true? If you're referring to the rumor that ibuprofen and Advil use can potentially uh, increase the problem? The answer is we don't know. Uh, we don't know. We can speculate. Yes, I did a show on this last week where I talked about ibuprofen and Advil and the mechanism of action and their COX, their COX inhibitors, cyclooxygenase inhibitors, and how um, blocking that particular enzyme can lead to a prolonged, potential prolonged response. Um, so there's pros and cons to it, and, and nobody knows for certain. So at this point, I mean, you know, depending on you as a unique individual, it really is going to be, it's going to depend on you as the unique individual. Because some people will say, well, can we take Tylenol instead? And the answer is, yeah, you could if you were trying to break fever, but should you break the fever? Like that really is the ultimate question. Now, if you're taking those medicines for pain management, then the next question is, why are you needing a drug to manage your pain? What are you doing wrong in your diet and your lifestyle that you're having pain to such a degree that you need to take something to manage it? Uh, let's see here. Juan says, how do you build pro how do you build muscle with a protein metabolism disorder like what I have? Um, you do your best. You don't that, you know you may have a disorder, but that doesn't mean that working out isn't going to stimulate growth hormone and other factors that help you build muscle. Um, you can certainly, if you have a protein metabolism disorder, depending on where the me metabolic issue is happening, you know, there's a number of different nutritional elements, depending on what kind of metabolic disorder you have that you can apply and implement. Let's see here. Lance says, Tabata's high intensity interval training. You can find a lot of workouts on YouTube. Best way to burn fat and build muscle. Thanks for chiming in, Lance. That's what I was talking about. You know, if you want to look up more workouts and get more ideas for how you can do Tabata, some people get turned off by the term high intensity interval training. They get scared. Um, you don't have to get scared. It's just a 20 second. Well, I had it on the board earlier. 20 seconds of work, 10 seconds of rest. There's nothing, nothing scary about any of that. So I like some of you are saying, I said, what are you going to be doing? And I said, fill in the blank. Some of you are saying, play guitar, meditate, uh, be happier, gardening, Photoshop, um, love it. So I've been playing a lot with my with my new birds. We've got a new goose and we've got a new duck and we've got some new chicks. I've been posting to Instagram. So those of you who aren't on my Instagram feed, you can check out our, our barnyard animals there. But that's kind of therapeutic for me and my family is to just be out in nature and to be able to uh, 
to smile at little tiny babies who are just experiencing the world in a new way for the first time. Yeah, so Robert chimed in on the uh, vitamin C um, therapy and, and how the dose should be much higher. Uh, he was talking, because I was talking about Dr. Weber. Dr. Weber's a doctor in New York. His dose is low, but I think his dose is low because he can't get enough. So here's the thing. I think he understands that it's important to do higher doses, but and they were doing higher doses from my understanding, but they were running low on supplies. So then they had to do something that was some, somewhat therapeutic. So they chose to go with a lower dose. Um, because again, because even at those lower doses, they're still seeing positive outcomes. Uh, Robert says, some people have stated that elderberry can cause or exacerbate a cytokine storm. Should we avoid taking elderberry to treat COVID-19? Um, again, elderberry doesn't treat COVID-19. Going to be real clear about that. There are no pills, potions, powders, lotions, drugs that have been proven to treat successfully COVID-19. That being said, with the disclaimer, does elderberry cause, cause a cytokine storm? The simple answer is no. There's no research. Look, by the time you're having a cytokine storm, elderberry doesn't trigger a cytokine storm. But if you're having a cytokine storm, it's because the virus has gotten so bad and it's destroyed so much of your lung tissue that that storm begins. It's like a snowball. Once it gets going, it just rolls out. And so elderberry is not going to be the thing that causes that cytokine storm. And neither, neither are any of the other herbals. I've, I've seen some of those articles floating around the internet, and there's just no science or research to back up the claims that some of those doctors are making. Uh, to me, they're doing a disservice to the community by making those claims. So my answer and my opinion on elderberry is that it's perfectly fine and safe to take. Let's see here. I like this. Lance says, I quit Zyrtec and took 1,000 milligrams of NAC for the first time last week, and I had a horrible hay fever-like allergy attack a couple of hours later. Have you ever seen this uh, reaction to NAC? No, you might have just had, if you quit Zyrtec cold turkey and, uh, and you'd been on it, you could have had a rebound effect. So it might have been the hay fever attack might have been that your immune system was trying to adjust. So that would be more my thought than anything else. Let's see, Elizabeth says, waking up at three to four and unable to fall back asleep. So there's, there's a, several different reasons why a person might do that. Um, I mean, sleep biology is pretty in-depth, but a few different kind of common reasons that we'll see people. One is if they're overstressed. And this is the perfect time for many of you that are overstressed. And so it's disrupting your sleep and you're waking up thinking about COVID-19. So how can, you, how can you kind of overcome that? One of the, and this is different for different personality types, but one is to get a good book and put it on your nightstand. And if you wake up and find yourself waking up, and, and, and the book should not be like a highly technical book that requires a lot of focus and attention. It should be something that's kind of a passive book, a book that you could fall asleep reading that doesn't keep you so focused on it that, uh, that you're wide awake and you can't go back to sleep. The other is meditation. Some people find that deep breathing, lying there in bed, deep meditation can be very, very helpful to stay asleep. You might also consider the fact that you may not be getting enough sunshine. Remember, uh, we, haven't even do we haven't even talked about melatonin and its antiviral properties that, that have been studied. But melatonin, which we make from getting sunshine, um, are, are, there's photobiology behind this. So when sunlight hits your eyes, you, you, it helps you to produce melatonin. And as you build up melatonin over the day, it's the thing that puts you to sleep at night. But it's also the thing that keeps you asleep during the night. So it's kind of like the balancing hormone to cortisol. So if you're not getting enough sunshine over the course of the day, you might not be building enough melatonin to sleep thoroughly throughout the night. So that would be, those would be some of the strategies I would say when I try to implement first. What do I recommend? Um, what do you recommend care for diabetes insipidus? Teresa, I would recommend getting with a, a solid functional doctor who understands diabetes insipidus and having some of the proper testing done to, to, to give you specific advice on what to do in that situation. Uh, is it safe to use grounding mats since we are forced to be indoors during this time, or do we need to worry about the dirty electricity? You, you can use grounding mats, but what's the best grounding mat in the world is the earth. So walk out barefoot. Um, if you Again, if, if you're locked indoors in a city and you can't get out and there's no possible way to get out, yeah, you can use the grounding mat. Um, I'd worry less about dirty electricity in that regard. The other thing you can use is a grounding sheet. Uh, grounding sheets, if you've never used them or haven't heard of them, you can look them up. They're available to purchase online, a number of different manufacturers, but grounding sheets um, actually are quite beneficial and quite helpful. 
How much NAC to take? I have it in powder form. Well, if you're just trying to take NAC as a kind of a, a good preventative, immune preventative, anywhere between 12 and 1500 milligrams a day right now is a, is a good amount. Now, is, some people take NAC as a mucolytic, meaning they're trying to help their mucus break up and break down. And that, in that regard, 1800 milligrams, 2400 milligrams, somewhere in that neighborhood is a good amount to take. I like your answer, Juan. Juan says, he, I said, what are you guys going to be doing instead of paying attention to all the, all the fear mongering? He says, watch glutenology videos. <laughs> Good deal, Juan. Um, aggressive rest therapy. Hoping to have time for that as I'm caught up in helping others. Hungarian friend said her family survived the Spanish flu, took half a teaspoon of bicarb soda to alkalinize. Um, yeah, aggressive rest therapy. I like that. And that's good. Does NAC pull metals out of the brain? I, 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 as far as I know, I, I have not seen any research studies that shows that NAC like, pulls heavy metal out of the brain. Now, there may be some speculation and there may be some people that talk about NAC being important for detoxification and for removing heavy metals from the body, but I can't, you know, and I, and not that I know every research study that's ever been published, but I've never seen any research that shows that NAC actually pulls heavy metal out of the brain. Um, now, NAC purports and promotes the production of glutathione, and glutathione is very, very potent, that detoxification of not just heavy metals, but a lot of things. But again, never seen any research on NAC as a, as a detoxifying agent for, for brain accumulative heavy metals. I agree with you, Dave. You know, you're not, you, it's the anti convinced. A lot of you like are panicked about COVID. And I will just say what Dave just said is he said, sorry for these anti conventional thoughts, but 61,000 people in the U.S. died last year from flu and there wasn't a frenzy. 81,000 in 2017, 2018. My thoughts, my thoughts are, are I agree. I, I think that the, I think that the several governments are overreacting to this. I think it should be, specific and targeted to the area that's being affected more than it should just be like in the state of New York. It's ridiculous to close down the entire state when a lot of the state's not even being affected. And I know what some of you may be saying, yeah, but they could get affected if the people in those dense population areas were to go out into the country and infect them. Yeah, but you can't shut, I don't know, this is just my opinion. You shouldn't shut down all function and all life for the fear of something. Like living in that limbic brain and that fear mentality doesn't serve us. And um, that's not to say this isn't a problem. And that's not to say that, that COVID isn't hurting people or killing people. That's not to say that the hospitals in New York aren't full. They are. But if we look at you know, where this virus has the potential to spread and really be affected, affecting people is in really, really dense urban population areas and really in, in the areas where the virus has a chance to spread unchecked. And so where there are a lot of bums and homeless people, it's a bad idea. To me, you shouldn't be quarantining uh, tax paying citizens, you should be picking up the people who have the ability to harbor this virus. And then that virus can mutate and spread through the population like wildfire. And what I've seen is I've seen tax paying citizens be shut up in their homes while, um, and, and this is even the case in Houston. I actually read the court order is that if somebody was homeless, you couldn't bother them. That they, they were not to be quarantined. They were not to follow the same rule of law that everybody else was being forced to, to follow. It doesn't make any sense. A lot of the governmental uh, bodies that are making some of these decisions, in my opinion, are messing up, but they're human. We're all flawed. We're, people are going to make mistakes. I just think if you can't dwell on it to such a great degree, that's why I say take care of your own because that's really all that you have the power to do is to take care of yourself. Let's see, Barbara, I'm sewing face masks for medical staff. Love it, Barbara. Uh, taking care of the folks that are taking care of other folks. Let's see, do we need to balance out our vitamin D3 intake with vitamin K2? If so, what would be the ratio? The answer is yes and no. Like for me, a lot of people will buy supplements online and they'll buy like a vitamin K or a vitamin D. Depends on how long you're going to be taking it. If you're like, for example, we talked about high doses of vitamin D as a therapy the other day. In that regard, you're only using it for three days. So in that case, you don't really need to be taking vitamin K with it because there's, there's not going to be any major detriment as a result of not doing that. The other, re, the other depends on whether or not you're actually vitamin D or vitamin K deficient. So like when people come to see me in my practice, we test them for vitamin D and vitamin K deficiency, and we make those decisions based on their own unique biochemistry as opposed to just generalizing 
that everybody taking vitamin D should also be on K and vice versa. How can you increase, I love this question. Diana wants to know, in the fight against COVID, how can one increase intracellular levels of zinc? So one of the best ways to increase intracellular zinc is by taking quercetin. Quercetin actually opens up the, um, the pores on the surface of the cells that allow, because remember zinc is an ion and so it's got a charge. And so there are pores in the cell membrane that allow those things in or out. And what quercetin does, according to some research, is it helps open up those pores to allow more zinc to flood into the cells. So if you want to increase intracellular zinc, one of the ways that you can go about doing it is, is quercetin. Now you can take supplemental quercetin. You can also eat foods that are higher in quercetin. And so, and so those are, that's probably the best known way to get your zinc levels into the cell to, to push it into the cell a little bit more aggressively. Let's see here. Um, I like that. Ruth chimed in. I take Dr. Osborne's magnesium and sleep soundly throughout the night. That's another strategy for better sleep is to use magnesium, especially uh, we've got a number of different kinds. I've got one called Clear Mag, which passes the blood brain barrier. It's a magnesium uh, with a special binder that passes through the blood brain barrier so that if you're struggling to get enough adequate magnesium into your brain for sleep function, that can be very helpful in that form. Um, what's the best brand of melatonin to use for kids? The one that's pharmaceutical grade, I mean, kids or adults alike. We have one called um, Melatonin CR, uh, controlled release. It's a controlled release so that it slow releases throughout the course of the night. Let's see, Danielle, licorice root has seemed to have helped me reset my diurnal clock. Yeah, licorice is a known, uh, is a known agent that aids cortisol and, and adrenal hormone output. So Jessica says, it's off topic. I've had restless legs since I was 10. Now I'm 36. I have been eating grain-free for two months. Is there more I could do by, uh, is there more I could be doing to help with it? Um, stay grain-free, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different nutrients that are known to cause restless legs. And I say nutrients, I mean nutrient deficiencies. So iron deficiency can cause restless legs. Folate deficiency can cause restless legs. Calcium or magnesium deficiency can cause restless legs. What I would suggest that you do is get with your doctor and ask them to run your intracellular levels of vitamin and minerals to see where you're at. And that way you know specifically what else you could be doing. Because otherwise you could guess at a lot of those different nutrients and you might be guessing wrong for what your current unique needs are. Let's see, is NAC better taken with food or on an empty stomach? Yes, with an empty stomach or away from other proteins. So the thing with NAC is it's an amino acid. So if you take, like if you eat a piece of steak and take your NAC, um, it's gonna compete with the other amino acids in that steak for its absorption. But if you ate a banana and took the NAC, then now it's not having to compete with other amino acids to really get in through those binding sites in your intestines. So the key is you can take it on an empty stomach. You can also take it with non-protein based foods or not heavily protein based foods because some people take NAC on an empty stomach and it makes their stomach upset and so taking it with a little bit of food can can kind of reduce that that symptomatology let's see here Uh, zinc is zinc good for dermatitis herpetiformis? Um, zinc is good if you're deficient in zinc and zinc is just good for us. It's an essential nutrient, but dermatitis herpetiformis is the skin manifestation of celiac disease. So the best thing you can do for DH is to completely cut grain out of your diet. And if this is new to you and you're not hearing this and you've just heard about the gluten-free diet, but you've been told wheat, barley, and rye, you should be cutting it out. Look, you need to be cutting out wheat, barley, rye, corn, oats, rice, sorghum, millet, teff, triticale, all the grains. If you don't know that, and this is the first time you're hearing it, go read No Grain, No Pain. Put that on your book list over this whole COVID-19 um, lock-in. Looking for a regular GP who will be supportive of your functional medicine protocol. What question do I need to ask, or is there a certain type of doctor? I think ultimately the question to ask is, or the, or the conversation to, to ask, if you're looking for a doctor to support a functional medicine protocol, 
is to simply say, look, doc, I, I really strongly and firmly believe that the power of nutrition and diet and lifestyle and choice is more powerful than any medicine you can give me minus a life-threatening situation. And, I, and if that's not something that you agree with or believe in or will honor, then maybe this isn't a good fit. Like you just need to go in and, and maybe before you make an appointment and waste your time is to call the office and just ask the staff, look, does the doctor honor and respect nutrition, diet, and lifestyle? Because if they don't, you're going to be butting heads indefinitely. Um, and it, to me, it's like a it's like ridiculous to even imagine that a doctor wouldn't honor nutrition, diet, and lifestyle as an important parameter of health, but you'd be surprised at how many that don't. Okay, let's see here. Does zinc compete with magnesium? Should I take these supplements at separate times? Um, there's a little bit of competition, but not severely so. You can take them separately. Do, did, do you find it difficult to give up cow dairy? I heard it increases mucus, but dairy is so addictive. Well, it depends on the type of cow dairy. I think, um, I think a lot of people struggle not with necessarily cow dairy. I think they struggle with the chemicals that are used in the dairy industry, the feed that the cows are being given, the hormones that the cows are being given, the genetic manipulation behind what kind of cows are being milked. I think it's deeper than, than the actual dairy itself. Um, but, you know, dairy can be mucogenic and, and some people are still are lactose intolerant and some people are still allergic to dairy, even if the dairy comes from a healthy source. So Dwayne wants to know how to lose more body fat and gain more muscle while taking a corticosteroid. So Dwayne, you know, I, this is not, I'll just be clear. This is not me telling you to stop taking your corticosteroid. Like, I don't want you to construe this as medical advice in that way, but one of the side effects of corticosteroids is muscle loss. So it's really, really hard to override the, the muscle atrophy effect that corticosteroids can induce. Corticosteroids, we know they cause atrophy, the muscle and the bone. We know they cause magnesium and calcium and zinc and vitamin D deficiency. We know they don't really solve the problem. I mean, it'd be one thing if you had major Addison's disease where you needed some cortisol because uh, without it, you would die. But you know, most people that are put on corticosteroids are being put on it because they have a little inflammation, uh, because because they have a skin rash or because they have inflammation in a joint or whatever it might be. And so, it's in my opinion, many doctors abuse the use of corticosteroids without considering the long term side effects, especially in the realm of autoimmune arthritis, where it's used almost like candy. You know, to Halloween trick-or-treaters, here's your corticosteroid, here's your corticosteroid. Instead of asking the question, why do you have inflammation? They say, let's block the inflammation. It's, you know, it's a philosophical mismatch. If, if you are being enlightened and this is like, wow, I, di I didn't realize that I could ask the question, what causes the inflammation? Because for a lot of doctors, they don't care what causes the inflammation. They only care that they have the medicine with the power to block inflammation. And so they're really just trying to appease your symptoms. They're not, they're, and that, they're not doing it out of ill will. I don't think they're doing it out of meanness or out of a desire to sell more drugs. I think they're just doing it as this is the tool they have in their tool belt. So this is the tool they're going to use. And they want to be compassionate towards you because you're in pain. So in, in that compassion, they're trying to help you. But what they don't realize or, or what they don't think about is that they're not really helping you if they're making you dependent upon a drug for the rest of your life to control pain and inflammation. And the only real world way to help you would be to help you identify the origin or the source of why that inflammation exists in the first place. So if you're struggling with weight loss and muscle loss, like losing weight and, and putting muscle on, there's a more fundamental question to ask, which is what is the need for that corticosteroid long term? Why are you using it? What are you needing to use it for indefinitely? Find that answer and you don't have to worry about doing something special to gain muscle and lose weight while you're taking a corticosteroid because the corticosteroid becomes an irrelevant part of the conversation. Let's see, what can a person who is quarantined in a moldy house do to alleviate chest pain, difficulty breathing, blurry vision, and other symptoms if mold illness when being outside isn't always possible? Boy, that's a tough one, Elaine, but I would say ask, call your doctor and ask them to write a prescription for a nebulizer. I'm gonna write this down for you, nebulized, Glutathione, you have to get it by prescription. So you got to work with your doctor on that one. But a nebulizer just basically it aerosolizes glutathione and you can breathe glut aerosolized glutathione into your lungs 
and it can have a profound impact on inflammation in your lungs and it might be helpful and it might help you kind of get through this time, but you gotta get a prescription to be able to do that. So call your doc and ask them about nebulized glutathione because your other option, they'll, a lot of doctors will give you that nebulized steroid inhaler or they'll give you that, that steroid. So Dave wants to know, with all we know about food being medicine, have medical schools introduced more courses about nutrition? If not, why not? Um, look, I don't know. I, I don't follow what every medical school does. I know it's still a major issue. The last time when I wrote No Grain, No Pain, and it was published in 2016, um, at last count, it was the average medical school had less than seven hours of training. Now, if you talk to a medical doctor and you say, well, you had seven hours or less of training, and you say, well, well tell me about that training that you had, what a lot of those doctors will say, well, we really didn't get any training in nutrition. What we got is we got training on how unimportant nutrition was. So the training was, was not nutritional training, but it was antithesis of nutritional training. So is that changed from, from 2016 to today? I don't know. Probably not a whole lot. There, most doctors still have to go outside of the medical curriculum to get postgraduate information as it relates to nutrition. Let's see here. So Dwayne, uh, as a follow-up to what you said, what I, we were talking about earlier, I had a benign pituitary tumor removed. My doctor said that the corticosteroid controls my kidney function. Well, if you had the tumor removed, then what do you need a steroid to control your kidney function for? I might get a second opinion on that. It doesn't, it, 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 you know, there may be some validity to what your doctor's saying, and there may be uh, there may be a lack of validity in a sense to what he's saying, or there may be another opinion that, that exists that might put you on a better path or, or a, a, a different path. Do I recommend to, Glenda wants to know, do I recommend Tabata for someone with rheumatoid arthritis if I exercise too hard, I have a lot more pain? So this is where, yes, I do recommend Tabata, but I also recommend something called scaling the Tabata. So what does that mean? So if you're suffering with rheumatoid arthritis and it flares you up, too much exercise can. Sometimes when a person has acute inflammation. Now, one of the things there would be, why are you being inflamed or why are you flaring up with exercise? You should be able to exercise even with rheumatoid arthritis. And so going back to, have you read No Grain, No Pain? Have you applied phase one and phase two of the diet? Because a lot of people that do that put their RA into complete remission. Um, that being said, a Tabata can be scaled. What does that mean? Scaled means you approach it to the level of fitness that you're at. So if you can't do a push-up, do a wall push-up. It's a little bit easier. It's not quite as aggressive. It might not cause you to flare quite as much. Same thing with like a squat. If you can't do a full squat because your knees, you know, your knees have fluid in them and they get inflamed, then you can do like a wall sit, like a wall hold where you just lean into the wall and you just hold the legs and you, and you do that 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. I mean, there's a variety of different scaled maneuvers where if, if, if one maneuver is too challenging or too difficult, then you can scale the maneuver back and do something a little bit easier that matches who you are and what your fitness level is. But there should never be an excuse not to be able to exercise, even if you have uh, a, a joint problem or even a, a really advanced case of rheumatoid arthritis where you've got limitations in your range of motion. There are things that you can do. There are band exercises. There are other motions and range of motion exercises that can be implemented. The key is to start because the longer you wait to start, the, the, the more damage is done. Remember that joints, joints themselves don't have a blood supply. How do they get nourishment? How do they get vitamins, minerals, and nutrients? They get it through movement. And when you stop moving a joint because it hurts, then the joint atrophies and the muscles around it atrophies. And then you start to develop not just an autoimmune arthritis, but you start to develop lack of movement leads to something called osteoarthritis, which is what doctors oftentimes refer to as age-related. It's not, has, it doesn't really have anything to do with age as much as it has to do with disuse. So it's disuse of the joint creates an arthritis that progresses with time. That's why people that get on bed rest for too long, they're stiff and their backs hurt and they, sometimes it actually makes them worse as opposed to better. Let's see. Um, 
Do I recommend a vibrating platform as a form of exercise? Yeah, that's, that's actually a, kind of a good side note to somebody who does have a lot of joint pain. A vibration platform or a vibration plate can be a good place to start in that regard because it's, um, it's a lower impact type of exercise that can still do uh, a lot to improve fluidic movement of synovium or the, the liquid that surrounds your cartilage to nourish the cartilage and to help start reversing uh, those damages. All right, let's see. Let's go down on the left side. Let's scroll down and look at some of those newer. Um, uh, let's see, go back. There we go. Sharon says, if you have a two-week wait, period, and you are out of your supplies, will your immune system be strong enough to withstand the virus? Clarify that for me, Sharon. What do you mean a two-week wait period for what? And supplies, what are you talking about? You're out of food or you, what, are you, what kind of supplies are you, are you out of? I would hope that your immune system, you know, could be strong enough to support you. Um, you know, again, but depending on the supply, if you're talking about food, you need food for your immune system. It's, you know, it's a critical element, especially protein. And I talked about that a few weeks ago, getting adequate protein for your immune system to maintain its healthy function during this time. Uh, let's see. Can you, uh, Nancy wants to know, can you tell me what not to eat if you have a diverticulitis? So far, I eat broth for three days and I eat soup in the blender, beet, apple, carrot. I eat probiotic, apple vinegar, uh, apple cider vinegar, drink more. And I cut, um, cut news because it stresses me too much. That's a good job, Nancy. Um, what not to eat. So if you have diverticulitis, meaning you have a little outpouching uh, where food traps can occur, then you want to eat things that don't have small particulates. So like seedy foods, you don't want to eat like a bunch of pumpkin seeds or like, you know, sometimes people put together like the trail mixes with a lot of seeds and berries and things of that nature with tiny seeds in them. Like you want to try to avoid those. You're probably doing a good job if you have active diverticulitis, meaning an active inflammation by eating purees, eating soups, eating pastes. If you're going to eat nuts, eat nut pastes that are already ground up into paste so that you don't have to worry about it again, getting trapped into those diverticuli. Ooh, Pamela, if you're an, an RN and you have RA and you're on a rinse and methotrexate, um, boy, I would do everything you could, Pamela, to support your immune function. You might, what I'd first do is talk, you know, if you're on the front lines and you're an RN and you've got, and you're taking immunosuppressant medications, you should not be on that front line. You might have a conversation with your, with your rheumatologist about those medicines that you're using. I, and I would, again, I would strongly encourage you to read No Grain, No Pain, because if you're having to use Arensia methotrexate to control your symptoms, and then there, you're also working that front line, you are one of the high risks. You, that defines you as a high risk person to pick this virus up. So to me, it's it kind of a dangerous predicament for you to put yourself into. Hi, hi, Misty. Good to see you back from the scleroderma community. Hi, scleroderma community. Love, love you guys. Um, stay strong. Let's see. Yeah, so uh, we've answered that one. What about Pilates? I think Pilates is great. I think the exercise that you can do in your home is great, provided you do it. That's the thing about exercise. Um, no exercise program is better than another uh, if you don't do it. So I'd say know what you like and do what you like because there's a greater likelihood that you'll be consistent with it because that's how exercise works. It's, it's a consistent application over time. And uh, just like diet and nutrition, consistent application over time. If I don't mind, what's liposomal glutathione? Never heard of it. Might be a different meaning here where I am. Maybe beneficial for me. Many thanks. Liposomal glutathione is just a type of glutathione that is absorbed better than regular glutathione. See, regular glutathione is a tripeptide. It's not really well absorbed in the intestines. So some scientists have wrapped it into a liposome, which gets better absorption across the intestinal uh, lining. My advice is I don't like a lot of your liposomals. And, and again, I, I've said this before. 
a lot of them have corn derivative or corn alcohol in them or some other kind of GMO ingredient. I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't care for that. So a lot of your liposomal technologies, I just don't, I don't use them because of those reasons. And, and again, if you've read No Grain, No Pain, you'll better understand that. Um, as far as what can you do if you want to boost your glutathione levels, one of the things you can do is take NAC, NAC, which we've, we've talked about a couple times tonight, but I did a whole show on a few weeks ago. Okay, I'm looking, I'm cooking lamb soup with fresh organic and veggies and kettle and fire bone broth, feeding the body and mind. Love it, Matthew Gibbs. That's awesome. That sounds like a good meal. I'm getting hungry myself. Now, uh, let's see. What's the best brand of melatonin? Um, you can check out our controlled melatonin CR, uh, melatonin CR controlled release. Uh, Lisa wants to know, I've been hearing a lot of lately about plant-based diets. Is this the he way of he eating healthy? Look, one diet for, no, it's, it's, it can be healthy, but it's not healthy for everyone. You know, a plant-based diet, I've seen people go down. I've seen people where their immune systems were literally crushed by a plant-based diet. And I've seen other people who did really dramatically well on a plant-based diet. I think more than anything else, it's which diet is right for you as a unique person is what should be assessed. And that in and of itself, that falls under what I call the three cardinal rules of nutrition, which is number one, you can't get healthy eating food that's not healthy. Number two, it's understanding what healthy is. So if you have a misconception about what is and what is not healthy, then you may, you may be a victim of indoctrinated information. And so a lot of these uh, plant-based communities say that plant-based diets are the only way to go and that there's no other form of healthy diet. And that's just not true. Um, some people thrive on a carnivore diet and some people thrive on a plant-based diet. Again, it's, it's getting to understand who you are as a unique person. Is there a nutritional component to nephrotic syndrome? Absolutely there is. Um, and oftentimes in my experience where I've seen nephrotic syndrome, even in children, it's an oftentimes caused by gluten sensitivity, not celiac disease, but gluten sensitivity. So if you haven't had your child checked for gluten sensitivity, that's something that I would ask the doctor to do immediately, especially if they've di diagnosed nephrotic syndrome and they have no reason as to why the nephrotic syndrome exists. They're telling you, we don't know what causes it, it's just there, and your child just happens to be the unlucky lottery winner of that horrible disease. No, there's usually a cause. You just have to dive into what that is. Is there an autoimmune component to Eller Danlos? Yes, there is. Um, Uh, let's see, Cheryl wants to know, have I ever heard of mega dosing on antioxidants like vitamin C resveratrol have negative side effects? Not really. Um, look, how many, how many people have died from vitamin C overdose? Zero. How many people died from aspirin last year? 13,000. How many people died from resveratrol last year? Zero. So, you know, a lot of, and that, that's not to say don't be concerned about the potential for negative reactions in supplements. Let's just say a lot of people and a lot of doctors try to scare people away from using natural agents, not because they're dangerous, but because they don't understand them and they try to project their own fear onto you and you just can't allow them to do that. Um, you know, vitamin C works. It works very, very well. Uh, can you take quercetin if you have diverticulosis? Yes, you can. Um, Let's see here. We got to wrap this up here pretty quick. Can how how long can you take NAC safely? You have several months. I mean, generally speaking, if you NAC it's side effects and symptoms of, of of I've had people on NAC for six months at a time with no side effects. So it's it's pretty safe to take unless you're super high dosing, and then you probably want to work with somebody who knows what they're talking about to monitor you. Okay. With coronavirus, they are saying if you take ibuprofen, when you have it, it will double the ACE2 enzyme. It doesn't double the ACE2 enzyme. It doubles the ACE2 receptor. So, Rebecca, you have to understand that um, surface of the cell, you have ACE2 receptors. And these receptors are how the virus, so if we look, we'll just call that coronavirus. They dock to that receptor, and then they penetrate the cell, and then they get access to your DNA. And that's why the theory behind ibuprofen is that you don't want to use it because it increases the quantity of ACE2 receptors on the surface of the cell. Other drugs do this too. Some of your blood pressure, blood pressure medications. There's a class of blood pressure medications called ARBs. 
angiotensin receptor blockers um, are known to also upregulate ACE2 and then ACE inhibitors. So check your, check your blood pressure medications and have a conversation with your prescribing doctor. That's the best thing that you can do. Don't uh, just stop taking them. But uh, these medications, ibuprofen, ARBs, and ACE inhibitors all increase the expression of ACE2 on the surface of your cells, allowing for greater capacity for coronavirus to have access to the internal mechanisms of your cells and replicate. So that's why you want to look at those things. Now, my advice is if you're, if you're, trying, to, uh, if you're trying to do something for a fever, go back and watch the show I did a couple of weeks ago on whether or not, when to, to lower fever, what to use to lower fever, and what not to use to lower fever, because we went in depth on that show. Okay, let's see here. Somebody's asking, so somebody purchased one of our immune packages online and they're wondering if it comes with instructions. Monica, no. The answer to that is, uh, you know, supplements are taken per the individual. We do give recommended suggestions, but you can also email glutenology at gmail.com if you want to get uh, kind of a more specific recommendation. Just email glutenology at gmail.com and uh, we'll get back with you on that. Okay, so somebody's asking, if you puree the raspberry and strain off the seeds, is that okay for diverticulosis? Yeah, if you're going that to that length to avoid the seed accumulation, yeah, that would be perfectly fine. Okay. What are your thoughts about ancient grains like quinoa, amaranth, and kamut and spelt? So first of all, quinoa and amaranth aren't grains. Technically, they're pseudograins. But quinoa has been shown in a couple of different research studies to actually activate the same HLA-DQ receptor, create inflammation that gluten, that wheat gluten does. 52%, I think the last study on amaranth showed amaranth cross-contamination with wheat and other gluten-free flours, so don't recommend it either. And as far as commit and spelt, they're not gluten-free, so don't recommend those as well. Just because something's ancient doesn't mean it doesn't contain gluten. Um, I mean, that's kind of a common misconception in, in, in what people believe, um, gluten is gluten. And 20 parts per million, meaning the size of a breadcrumb, can create inflammatory damage for up to two months. So um, you want to try to avoid it. If you have gluten sensitivity, you definitely want to avoid it. Okay, we're going to wrap this up. Before I go, I want to make sure those of you who are new tonight, you know, come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter. It's the world's largest number one gluten-free newsletter. If you want to learn more about the true gluten-free diet and how to navigate the diet and overcome autoimmune problems. Uh, also, make sure that you type in, if you didn't already, some of you are already doing it, and I greatly appreciate that. Remember what our mission is. It's to save 100 million lives, and the only way we're going to do that is to get people out there educated, and you help me get those people educated by sharing and by hashtagging so that people can find us. So if you know a loved one, if you've got a family member, if you know somebody who could benefit from the information, on the Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Don't be stingy. Share the love. Pay it forward. Together we can help more and save 100 million lives. Look, I'm wishing you all uh, a fantastic week and stay safe. And, uh, and again, take to heart what we talked about today. I think it'll take you through this pandemic with flying colors. We'll see you next Monday for another episode. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. 
Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.